This segment is the House Judiciary Chairman. He's also a candidate for higher office, as they say. More Capito. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Rob. It's good to be with you, and uh, thank you for having me on. Would you like to be killed in John Gilstrap's next book? You know, as you were giving that intro, I was trying to think, you know, what is my story going to be in this thing? So I better uh, watch my P's and Q's this morning. I have or learned. I'm going to be eating Chef Boyardee. <laughs> it, in, in my line of work, it's never a good idea to kill off a politician. It's just not not ones with real names. However, you get in trouble. You open up investigations on yourself if you do that. Well, so. we have traveled all over this state, and I've heard some stories, so uh, we can pass those get, along. Yeah. You get, you get, he is the judiciary chairman. Right? You could do uh, Core Mapito. That's true. That's Nobody true. would ever. Figure Nobody that would out. ever figure it out. That's right. <laughs> not happening. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is interesting because uh, we have uh, Charlie Trump, the Senate Judiciary Chairman, who's uh, a candidate for Supreme Court. You are a candidate for Governor. Uh, so judiciary in the uh, chambers next year is going to look entirely different than what it looks like this year, potentially. Judiciary, I, I like to say, I mean, I'm a little bit biased here. I think it's the, uh, it is the best committee uh, in the legislature. You know, Matt's been been down to the legislature and spent time there. Uh, it's the hardest working committee. It certainly sees the most legislation of any other committee. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a person that uh, believes in good leadership of committee, but I also believe in the process. Uh, and, and, and so there'll be a process, and, and, and there'll be plenty of legislation, I'm sure. No question. What brings you to the Eastern Panhandle today, Moore? Well, every time uh, we you know get over to the Eastern Panhandle, I try to come in here and start my morning uh, with you all. It's always a pleasant place to be. Uh, I love the Eastern Panhandle. Of course, um, I was sort of raised that way as a kid. Uh, we used to joke that my um, when I was in high school, I would say that you know, my brother and sister and I would say, well, where's, you know, where's mom? And we said, oh, she's at her second home in the Eastern Panhandle. So it was inculcated early uh, that it was a critical part of the uh, the state indeed. And um, certainly uh, I have family in the Eastern Panhandle as well. So we spend lots of time here. And uh, with all of that being said, uh, it's a great place to come and really study what's going on because what's going on in the Eastern Panhandle is uh, special and explosive. I know that there are uh, challenges, um, but uh, we're spending as much time here as we can. Very good. And uh, is there another interim session before you folks uh, close out the year? There are actually two. We've got one coming up in about three weeks. Uh, I believe it's in, um, I think it's uh, three weeks in Wheeling. This year they're going to be doing that at uh, Ogilvy. Mm -hmm. And so it's always nice to get folks that are uh, that's why I don't really spend most of my time in um, in Charleston I like to get out and be out and listen to people uh, whether it's here or in the northern Panhandle or uh, Ohio River Valley wherever it is uh, it's always nice to get uh, I think the legislators um, out um, to different parts of the state to, to not only to see it but to talk with uh, and listen to the folks that are on the ground. So it'll be another good one. That'll be the second interim that we've done outside of uh, Charleston this year, which, again, I, I encouraged uh, the speaker when he mentioned it to do it, and I think we should do more of them. So there'll be two. There'll be one in November and December, and then there'll be a short one in January right before the session. Are there specific things that uh, are designed to be worked on during those? You know, the speaker has asked all of uh, the, particularly the committee chairs and the interim committees to come up with, legislation uh, to hear dialogue on and to, to listen to uh, to listen to and receive uh, professional feedback uh, from stakeholders across the state to try to work up pieces of legislation I believe we'll we'll see that and in the next couple of weeks I think we'll actually have copies of some of that legislation that I'll send to you yeah very nice yeah yeah uh, let's talk about your race uh, for governor right so what are we to believe when we see different polls and then those polls represent uh, people who are in different positions, either in the lead or close by, and, and some don't. What do you make of all this? Well, I tell you what, we've uh, spent the last uh, 10 months driving across and barnstorming the state of West Virginia. I think we're up to about 50,000 miles now uh, going and just simply sitting down and listening to people. You know, as a lifelong West Virginian and a father of two kids, uh, I can tell you that there is a lot of uh, commonality throughout the state of West Virginia and the conversations that you have, those kitchen table conversations, whether it's about going to the grocery store or going to soccer practice or what it's like to get uh, you know, your kids to school, get to work and get your kids after school on time. Um, all of those sorts of conversations are sort of common throughout the state of West Virginia. And then, of course, we have our regional challenges. You know, the Eastern Panhandle has challenges. Um, that that, that uh, you know that we're facing uh, certainly with infrastructure and in a growing 
um, you know, a, a, a growing community. And then, you know, Southern West Virginia has its uh, challenges, but there are some common challenges, you know, and there'll be a lot of uh, polls throughout this race. It's still, we've, I, I think we've got six or so months to go and we're not going to let up on that travel schedule at all. I think the best news is, is that when you look at any of these numbers, there's been one thing that's been absolutely common. And as that has shown that we have grown rhythmically from the time that we started this race. We continue to grow. We have uh, a great uh, opportunity to grow. And the reason that we're growing is because we're spending so much time in front of uh, and talking with and listening to West Virginians. And, uh, you know, there are other people in the, these polls that are doing different things. Um, but I like the way that our numbers are moving compared to others. How is the fundraising atmosphere right now when you're trying to run a race that's statewide? Well, after this, I was going to talk to you about maybe coming on board to do some of that, Rob. Sure, uh, baby. What do you need, man? <laughs> I mean, you know, the voice of a radio, maybe that's what you really need. No, it's, uh, it's really great. And I'll tell you what, um, our campaign is extremely uh, proud of the fact that we have the vast majority of our contributing base um, is West Virginians. Uh, we have West Virginians that are contributing to our efforts, that are contributing to our movement. Our message of being the get it done conservative in this race is resonating with the people of West Virginia. And they're not only vocalizing that, they're contributing, they're contributing to our efforts. You know, sometimes it's a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. But you know what? Those people want to work hard for and believe in uh, a new generation of leadership so that's critically important you know there's a lot of out-of-state money coming into this uh, race it's not going into my campaign and i can tell you they can bring as much out-of-state money uh, as we want to to this state and we'll make them spend it all and it still ain't gonna make a difference john gilstrap you're wandering around and you're talking to West Virginians. You're on this, this great I hope I'm travel. not wandering. Well, no, no. Well, I'm a little yeah, more deliberate you, than okay. that, John. You have, you have <laughs> targeted places to go. In, in the discussion with the citizenry of West Virginia, have you found any surprises where priorities for the public that you didn't think were as important or perhaps priorities for you that you found are not quite as important? Uh, that's a really good question. I think one of the things, the, one of the common themes that we hear throughout the state, regardless of where you're going in West Virginia. So if you're going to a county that is sort of seen flat growth, if you're going to a county that's seen increased growth, even some counties that have seen decline in population, we are seeing a, an absolute need for affordable housing. I've had discussion. I know that that is a critical issue in the Eastern Panhandle, finding places to build and develop homes is a huge thing. Now, when you say affordable housing, is that, is that code for low-income housing, or is it's it sort of middle-tier housing? Is okay. what we're hearing. You know, not the not the mansions, uh, and 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 sort of not the you know one bedroom small house, but family homes, small okay. family homes is what I'm I'm really going at there. And of course, the price price is going to fluctuate depending on where you go, but. Uh, affordable housing has been thematic throughout the entire state without question. Um, education, there's no doubt that uh, we know, and I've said this before, that education is the biggest moral and economic issue that we face in West Virginia. We're having some uh, wins clearly in West Virginia with some of the um, installations that we've had, particularly here uh, in the Eastern Panhandle, you know, with Procter and Gamble and Clorox and those sorts of big investments. We've seen them now in the Ohio River Valley uh, with uh, Nucor and, and Berkshire Hathaway. And I think we look to this area to see as proof that those sort of uh, investments and installations uh, in, in those areas can have very long tentacles and impact. Uh, the other thing we hear a lot about is child care. Uh, you know, I've got two young kids. I've got a five and an eight year old. So, you know, I get it. it you want to have two parents that are in a household that are working. Um, they've got to have availability of child care and it's not there. So I mean, I'm never going to, you know, no parent ever wants to face the choice of, am I going to go to work or, or my child? That's an easy choice. You're going to choose your child, of course. Um, so that's a huge challenge. How are uh, parents finding daycare? And if you can find it, quite frankly, it's astronomically expensive. So that's crippling for our economy right now because we're not getting the folks that actually want to enter the workforce into the workforce. So those are some of the, the topics that you don't hear people sort of screaming from the, you know, from the galleys, uh, if you will, for change. But those are critically important issues uh, particularly when we're looking for, and when I talk about the most important thing we can do as West Virginians is grow. 
And with growth, we're going to have to we're going to have to double down on that, and we're going to have to pay very, very close attention to and be preemptive about how we handle our infrastructure in West Virginia. You know, over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've had a number of guests on here, and the, and the theme is or has been, it turned out to be. Uh, issues with children, that the uh, foster care rate in West Virginia is twice mm -hmm. that of the next uh, worst or best. You know, have, we, we put twice as many children into foster care as the next most foster care state. We've got... Um, there, there was really no easy way to word that, though. What no, there really wasn't. <laughs> um, I'm tracking. <laughs> we're... we're <laughs> 20% of the students across the, the state are truant. 20% have missed over 18 yes. days of, of school. We all know that the performance of school in schools is, is not that great. We're either 49 or 48, depending on, on how you look at it. Thank God for Mississippi, right? Otherwise, you know, we'd, we'd be at the bottom. So what, what's the handle to pull on that? Because there has to be a common theme because the children are the common theme. How do you attack the problem? Yeah, absolutely. We just had a legislative interim session earlier this month that focused on this very issue that you're talking about. And we, we took a holistic approach. We brought a judge and we brought in folks from DHHR to talk to us about the crisis that is uh, the foster care system. And, and frankly, more broadly, how are we catering to children in the state of West Virginia? And again, as a father, there's nothing more important to me than ensuring that we have a next generation of of, of of individuals and West Virginians that are not only passionate about West Virginians, but that are healthy, educated, and ready to enter the workforce and want to enter the workforce in West Virginia. And that starts at a very young age. We know that we're severely understaffed when it comes to CPS workers. We've talked about that. We're trying to find ways that um, we can increase opportunities and, and, and grow that. Uh, some of the stories that we heard from uh, the, um, your judge actually was judge down. Redding. Yeah, Judge Redding was with us. He was great, um, and very, and you know told us things that probably people don't want to hear but need to hear uh, in order to spur action. And I had people that came up to me uh, after that interim meeting to say, you know, thank you for doing that. Uh, and of course, we're thanking Chairman Trump, who who was instrumental in putting it all together. I know he's very passionate about the issue as well. But it's absolutely something that we have to pay attention to. And as we come into the educational system where these kids are are going to be spending a good bit of time over the next you know 12 to 13 years what sort of services are we providing children within the school system we did we we passed the third grade success act last year we know that all metrics show us that um, outcomes improve when our children are learn have learned to read by third grade because after third grade they're reading to learn uh, that's a critical marker that we have to ensure that we're making the next additional and supplemental thing we have to ensure that we get in school is is, is mental health um, whether it's professionals or through telehealth uh, and providing more wraparound services i will tell you that the community and schools program that the first lady has put into place has been working very very well in some of these underserved communities you have folks that are in the community that come in and are more high touch with some of these kids that are having problems at home. And uh, the, the, the metrics are showing um, that it's benefiting. And again, going back to education, we have to have world-class education in West Virginia. I've always been a proponent of school choice. I was a big part of putting together the most bold sort of school choice and voucher program in the country at the time that we put together and we passed uh, forward in West Virginia. But we have to have a robust uh, public school pre-K through 12 system and there's no question about it. You look at all of the states that are growing and you got to have it and we have to make sure three things. We got to make sure that we give teachers the tools that they need to succeed. I mean some of the some of my uh, the, the most important people in my life and mentors were my teachers and my coaches and um, we've overloaded, overloaded them to a level to where now they can't even teach. So uh, we have to let them to get back to teaching and inspiring, providing the tools, supplemental help. But how? Providing supplemental help in reading and, and reading, which we just did last year. That's going to take some time to build up. Providing more mental health services. So whether that means bringing in health care professionals, bringing in more counselors, we absolutely know that these kids are falling behind because they can't, they aren't healthy enough to learn. And the third thing is it's a cultural thing. When I grew up, I mean, my mom woke me up and she said, get on the bus. And if I didn't want to get on the bus, it wasn't a choice. You got on the bus. 
the level of chronic absences is, is very troubling. But what we do know by those numbers, if you peel them back, is that it's a consistent subset. So we have to ensure that our parents are getting engaged. That's a difficult thing to legislate, but there, there's no question that if you look at a school that's succeeding versus one that's struggling, I will bet and guarantee you that the one that's succeeding has more parental involvement. So we've got to get parents and grandparents involved. That comes into our foster system too for kids that mm -hmm. aren't at home. Uh, we certainly have a lot of work to do, but I am 100% focused and think that that's probably the biggest issue that we're going to face if we want to grow. Mr. Harvey. Well, one observation I've had, uh, Chairman, if I can just share that with you, is is a lot of windshield time that parents are forced to have to endure to, to drive to find employment. And even here in the eastern panhandle, we have a, a tremendous amount of people going into the city or going east to, for employment, and that's time that they're not with their children. And something's raising the children, whether it's the parent or a, a, an in-law or a grandparent or the, or their friends or the internet. So, um, you know, we're not immune to that issue here in the Eastern Panhandle about the absenteeism. And it's not because the parents are unengaged. They, they have to work either one job, drive a long ways, or work multiple jobs just to, to be able to make the, um, be able to afford rent or, or a mortgage here in the Eastern Panhandle. But um, it really wasn't a question. That was more of a comment. Um, so you have there's there's four people going back to the governor's race there's four people right now that we know of that are that are in the race is that or well no I'm, i think there's, there's, there's more than that i'm sorry there's, yeah. there's there's five or six that's in the race um is there going to be an opportunity to, for voters to uh be able to see all the candidates at, at one time and you know like in a debate or a, a town hall i know that there was one for the west virginia chamber at the greenbrier mm -hmm. And maybe there was some others. Is there any more on the horizon? So we've had two opportunities where the four, where four of the candidates that are running for governor right now have been together. I welcome those opportunities. I think it's healthy for uh, for voters to be able to compare and contrast. And quite frankly, I I, I, I like being in that arena. I mean, you know, as as you know, being judiciary chair, there's nothing you do more than stand on your feet and uh, talk about what you're passionate about and defend it. Um, so we're fully prepared to to do that. I think West Virginians deserve that. And and in the meantime, that's why we've been driving all over the state of West Virginia is because I want West Virginians to have the opportunity to meet me so they can make a decision on whether they feel like I can be the person that can be the most competent and the most gritty and the most determined new sort of leader that they want. And frankly, that's really resonating right now. Is there are you aware of any events? in the Eastern Panhandle that the listeners could come to? I'm not aware of any that have been scheduled so far uh, in this area. They have scheduled, a, there is a debate scheduled where three of the candidates have uh, committed to be on uh, statewide, which is December 7th at 7 p.m., which will be streamed through, uh, uh, I think it'll be streamed online and then on the radio okay. with Hoppy. I, I saw that you were at the new core. You were part of the record-breaking yeah. Uh, what shovel? The shovel line. So they get up. <laughs> so they get up there, and everybody's excited, of course, about Nucor. Three billion dollar investment. You drive on that road, and you look towards the river, and if you, and which I never had, you look over, and you, for the first time, maybe see what a billion dollars looks like. I mean, these, the dirt that they've moved, or maybe the corn that they've moved, because it was a cornfield. Is, is really sort of breathtaking. So we get in there and there's all of these people and the excitement, the best part of it, quite frankly, were all of the students that were there. And we get in and they say, we're gonna break ground today, but we have a surprise. Went, okay, well, what's the surprise? And uh, they said, we're gonna set a Guinness Book of World Record today. And technically the record was, it was a dirt moving relay. It was the Guinness Book <laughs> of World Record. And the previous record was 250 people uh, and I think the record was broken. They had 550 shovels, and you had it. Now you, there was a little, there was a little bit of pressure. You had to have your shovel out of the ground when the person to your left was about to dig, and you had to shovel in the dirt and move the dirt within five seconds for the record to be able to continue. So you probably didn't want to be the 249th person. You might have been a little shaky with that shovel to make sure you got the timeline and everything. But nevertheless, all kidding. I mean, 
what a wonderful thing. I mean, you look at the impact that that's going to have. It's incredible. There were high school kids there and college kids that were excited already to apply. I mean, that's the sort well, they, of enthusiasm. It's a $3 billion investment by Nucor, who's a established company. And I, I heard the CEO or, or the West Virginia C. Um, John Rick, Ferris. Yeah, say that, that the average compensation management below package is going to be about $140,000 mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, and, and that's game changing for that uh for that region that won't be just mason county that'll be putnam county county that'll be cabell county that'll be jackson county uh that'll probably go all the way to roan and canal of where where sort of that impact is going to go when you look at where folks are going to live where they're going to send their kids to school where they're going to spend their money they're going to grocery shop all of those things so it's definitely a game changer i applaud the governor and his team uh, for bringing that one in, of course, we helped in the legislature to 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 to, to find a reasonable package to 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 present to them, and it's well worth it because I'll tell you what, that company is not only breaking ground and going to spend three billion dollars building a plant and employing hundreds and hundreds of West Virginia. That company is already a community partner. They've partnered in uh, the school systems. They've partnered with the United Way. Uh, and they're really putting their money where their mouth is in making West Virginia a better community and strengthening it. And let me add to that. It, it, my last big boy job it put me in contact with Nucor and actually CMC mm -hmm. is coming to the Eastern Panhandle. Those two companies are the gold standard for safety and environmental mm -hmm. compliance on things. They're really, really high end, good companies. No question about it. Uh, and, and you can see that. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you've, mm -hmm. You know, you've worked with them, John. I mean, the, the, the way that they conduct themselves, the way that they treat other people, the way that they treat folks in the community, the idea that they're not just an employer, but they're a community partner was, was um, transparent in everything that they did, which is encouraging. No question about it. More final minute is yours. Three things that we got to do to take West Virginia to the next level. We're, we're on quite a roll. Right now, we've had a lot of big economic wins. Uh, as I said, I'm the get-it-done conservative in this race, I've, whether it's delivering the largest tax cut in the history of the state of West Virginia, providing school choice for parents in West Virginia, making sure that our fentanyl dealers and our human traffickers are spending more time behind bars and less time on our streets. I'm somebody that's gotten it done. But we have to focus on having the safest communities in the country and backing the blue and ensuring that our law enforcement uh, and our first responders have the funding they need. We need world-class education in West Virginia. We have to ensure that we unlock the energy resources that we have right under our fingertips so that in this small window, West Virginia can really lead the world and lead this country back to energy independence and focusing on our entrepreneurship like places we see every day here in the Eastern Panhandle to ensure that we're growing those small businesses and planting those seeds for the jobs of the future. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate you having me on. Anytime you're around. You see the guy in the suit in the in the, in the uh, other Holy studio cow. Huh? Royalty. Mo Mogul is here. <laughs> That's uh, House Judiciary Chairman Moore Capito, candidate for governor of the state of West Virginia. We appreciate him stopping by. Thanks, Rob. This segment.